Hi, welcome to the show. My guest today is Sarah Glidewell. Her Airbnb business has grown considerably since her first appearance on my show a couple of years ago. I have followed her business since then and know that she runs it at the highest of standards. She's here to give us advice about what to look for when booking our next Airbnb stay, and also to talk about her mentorship, where she teaches people how to run an Airbnb business at that same high standard, making sure to follow all county regulations, not annoy the neighbors, and attract ideal clients for Airbnb stays. Welcome back to the show, Sarah. It's been a couple of years. Absolutely. Thanks for having me. Yeah, I've been following you on Instagram and you who were on the show a couple of years back talking about your Airbnb business and just kind of where you started from. And I've been following along and now you have more properties, but also a mentorship. And I think it's brilliant the way you've gone about everything. And I'm, I don't know that you planned it this way to look brilliant or feel brilliant, but it is <laughs> from an outsider looking in. So let's get into it. Let's remind people. So you started in the Airbnb business in 2019, not really expecting it to become a full-time gig, let alone teaching other people how to do it and do it well. Absolutely. Yeah. Didn't expect it to turn into what it has, but it's been a journey. That's for sure. <laughs> so you started out mostly renting apartments and then re-renting them as Airbnbs. And tell me what you liked about that, but then also why you decided to transition into owning your own properties. Yeah. So we started in apartment complexes in 2019 because it didn't have that huge down payment that purchasing real estate does. So we were able to just rent a le or lease an apartment, furnish it, and then re-rent it on Airbnb. And we could get those up and running for anywhere from, you know, seven to $15,000 and it would be all ready to go and you could rent it. Um, and then as we started saving up money, we saw all of the tax benefits, all of the equity game, all of the ownership sides that um, that owning B&Bs had versus renting them. And so we decided to make that leap once we had enough for our first down payment. Uh, we just didn't know what the income difference would be between arbitraging apartment complexes and actually owning real estate. Um, and the second we started owning real estate, we were like, wow, we love not having the landlord as a part of the conversation. We love being able to have full control over the property because we own it um, and we like the the additional perks that comes with that. So we have been running with the ownership side of things ever since. And part of that, when you say seven to $15,000 to get up and going, you're furnishing it, you're putting all of the details and all the touches that's, you know, that it, it's not just first and last month or whatever. It's actually getting it ready for someone to come in and basically live in for two days or two weeks or two months. Absolutely. And we always try and spend a little bit more than our competition on the interior of our properties because the nicer the property is, the more you can charge for it. And typically the more respectful guests are when you are targeting a higher end clientele. So we always splurge a little bit more than our competition does. Well, we're definitely going to get to that part, too. I want to talk about that in just a moment. I have, I think I told you about this when I was on tour, but we'll talk about it in just a second, one of the Airbnbs I stayed in. And I, I mean, you can research and research and research and read all the reviews and still sometimes you get surprised. Um, so then when you made the transition to home ownership, did you let all the rental type apartment properties go? Or you kept those two and you did the ownership properties? What did you do in that transition? Yeah, we still have the apartments in Texas that were running in 2019 and 2020. Um, those properties are still going strong. We love them. We appreciate them. Um, they funded a lot of our, our purchases that we've made since then. Um, but since then, we've just, because of all the added benefits, we've really focused on growing that ownership side of it. So we still have the apartments, but when it comes to how we're moving forward, we're really focusing on making sure that we actually own the properties. Now, you have properties in your area there in Michigan and then also in upstate New York. So why upstate New York? I know you're very focused on the ones you have where you are. What what appealed to you about upstate New York specifically since it wasn't somewhere that you would be regularly to manage them? Yeah. Well, in us being from Michigan, we just we knew the state really well. Right. We were born and raised here. We understood that people in Michigan wanted to go to middle of nowhere lake houses all summer long. Um, and a lot of what we were seeing is that primarily our traffic and our B&Bs, because we make them more high end than everybody else, was coming from Chicago, Grand Rapids, Detroit. So it wasn't people from small towns coming to another small town location. It was 
larger spenders who still wanted to be in the middle of nowhere, but they wanted their creature comforts that they were used to having in Chicago, Detroit, and Grand Rapids. And so we saw the same sort of trends happening in middle of nowhere, New York, but with New York City traffic. And believe it or not, New York City traffic pays even more than Chicago traffic does. So we just saw upstate New York as kind of a copy and paste of what we were doing in middle of nowhere, Michigan. And so you have you I see you in your reels and in your videos and your stories, very hands on, very involved in the day to day. It's your it's your job running this. It's your career. It's what you do. And and down to the, you know, you were sharing the cleaning closet and showing how what a mess it was and you had to replace the cleaner. So you're really involved in the day to day. I mean, some of it looks glamorous and fun and fantastic. And some of it looks like any job would look. Absolutely. I mean, I will say it's much less than a 40 hour work week, right? Especially if you've only got one property and one property replaced my nine to five income. So uh, there is a lot of dirty work that still goes into it. Um, and for us, we just, we want that expect that exceptional hospitality that we want every single guest to have um, to carry through all of our properties. And so that requires us to continue to be involved when we switch out cleaners. We don't want old cleaners to feel like they're our new cleaners to feel like they're cleaning up old cleaners messes and things like that. Um, and we want our, the people that work for us and help us run these B&Bs, we want them to feel like we are involved, that we are creating culture for their work-life balance as well. So I don't think we would have to be as involved as we are, but we just, we love it. We enjoy it. We want to be. And we is you and your best friend in business together, the Carwells. Yep, absolutely. So play on both your last names. <laughs> yes. Yeah. We've been best friends for 20 years. So it was a no way. And still best friends <laughs> in business. Uh, yeah. <laughs> Stood the test. We'll be back in just a moment. We're back talking with you, Sarah, all things Airbnb. And one of the things I wanted to get to uh, is the neighborhoods that you're in. So there's a lot of people who don't like na- having Airbnbs in their neighborhood, yet they like to go stay in Airbnbs in neighborhoods. And I know it's inevitable that there will be Airbnbs in our neighborhood, and there are a couple. My only concern is that whatever rules I have to follow, according to my HOA, I want to make sure that Airbnb is following. And my guess would be the best thing you can do as an Airbnb owner is to just get along. I mean, stand your ground when you need to. But play fair, get along, and try to follow the rules of that particular neighborhood. Otherwise, that's a whole other layer of stress, correct? Absolutely. And what I see a lot of with hosts is they get so anxious about dealing with the neighbors that they just never deal with them. They never introduce themselves. They don't go and tell their closest neighbors that it's going to be a and b because they're just trying to avoid that conflict. And in our experience, especially because we have lake houses and lake houses are butted up next to each other. I mean, they're like an arm's distance apart. We handle it head on. We don't want our neighbors to feel like we're giving them the middle finger. We're ignoring them. We're, you know, we don't care about the current culture of the community that we're entering into. And so we always drop letters in all of our neighbors' mailbox as we're bringing these B&Bs to life, letting them know that we try and have a really luxurious experience. We try and bring in quality clientele that's staying in our B&Bs. And then we give them our phone numbers and we just tell them, like, look, the best thing you can do is tell us if something is happening when it's happening. Like, don't stew on it because then we can't reach out to the guests and tell them to quiet down or move their car because it's parked in the wrong spot or whatever. We want them to feel like they are a priority to us. And when they reach out to us, we make it a priority to try and handle the situation as fast as humanly possible. Well, one thing on the flip side is you as an Airbnb owner, you can probably give really good advice for people who are looking to stay in an Airbnb. When I was on the final Don't Wait Project tour that aired on this show, I did extensive research. I mean, we were in a different city every couple of days. It was almost a four-week tour. It's a lot. And I read the reviews. I look at the pictures. Boy, pictures can be deceiving. But one place I stayed, I have to tell you about this. One place I stayed, it had, you know, a couple of hundred, you know, 4.75 and above reviews. And that's pretty subjective, too. Depends on who's staying there, I guess, to give the review. But they had a cutout to the bathroom door. Like, it wasn't even a clean cut. It was just like, broken out of the door and when you open the door it was so that it could open the door and not hit the toilet at the door 
face the kitchen. And I was not okay with that. And there were blinds were broken in the room I was staying in. I had to change in the bathroom because I couldn't close the blind. So I stuck a pillow in there at night. So at least, you know, I felt like I didn't have people peeping toms or something. The list goes on and on. And I reached out and Airbnb immediately said, take pictures and get a refund. I mean, I'm just telling you all, you've heard all the horror stories. Airbnb was amazing. They said, take a couple pictures. The company, the the host offered the refund, but they got upset that I used their iron and stuff. I had no time to put anything away because I spent time filing the claim and still had to get to filming. I was late to get on set, all the things. But I was like, how did this happen? I did everything right. I did all the research and I ended up in this awful place. We got our refund. We upgraded and went to another place. But what's your advice for people when they're looking and you read the reviews or you look at the pictures? I hear stories like pick a place next to a Whole Foods because most of the Airbnbs are going to be nice over there or whatever the case. But what's your advice? My advice, and this is something that I follow personally as well, is I really don't stay at anything that is less than a 4.8 star. I mean, there's a lot of ways that people will squeeze a five-star review out of someone, and that could include refunding them, cleaning fees, you know, trying to almost bribe them to give them that five-star review. And so if you see anything that's like a 4.7, immediately I'm like, nope, there have been people who have had a horrible experience here and they actually have left a review over it. And so it's, it's one of those things that I think Airbnb is doing a good job at like taking the guests side and saying like please show us these things and we are going to you know have some sort of consequences for the host and we have felt that like I have heard so many hosts that have been extremely frustrated with guests who have been frustrated with them and their property getting canceled or suspended or whatever the case may be but for us we're competing with not only every other Airbnb but hotels and I think that Airbnb operators don't see themselves as a hotel operator they see themselves as a mom and pop operator and so they don't put the pressure on themselves to have a professional experience and that is why we scream from the mountaintops every single day on social media on how to do it right because we ourselves are sick of staying at B&Bs like that <laughs> that gets to us to our next part and we'll ease into that cuz I want to talk about it next segment but one quick question about that, because I want to talk about your mentorship and how you're teaching people. And I love that you're the one teaching people because of the caliber that you operate at, you know, the standard that you've set in your industry. It's pretty, it's pretty incredible. Um, and so when you talk about the choices and the 4.8s and the reviews, I didn't, I didn't even realize, and let's explain this to people because people may not realize, maybe they do, maybe I was not paying attention, but, you know, they can review you too. And I didn't know that. And I, I haven't had a bad review. I had a miscommunicated review that I let them know what, what the situation was, was about the locks. But, um, you know, so you want to make sure that you do the things on the list and make sure you leave the place the way that you said you would when you signed up. Yeah, because we're kind of getting attacked from both sides, right? Like, if we're not offering a great experience, of course, our guests are mad. But when you talk about neighbors, it's like if our guests aren't following our rules and aren't good guests to host, then our cleaners are mad, our neighbors are mad, then all of a sudden townships and counties are mad. And so we have to follow the rules to offer a professional experience to our guests, just like our guests need to follow the rules of being semi-professional in somebody else's space and realizing that the neighbors aren't on vacation, even if you are the neighbors <laughs> So we want other hosts to realize what kind of person they're hosting by leaving them an honest review as well so that a host isn't going to host them and then have a problem just like we had. Exactly. Now let's talk real quick about the county part of it you brought up. So you shared the other day that you have a property that you're listing for sale because the zoning has changed. And you're not grandfathered into that situation. It is what it is. And so you're selling an entire property that you've put your hard into. Yeah, yeah, that is the volatility of Airbnb right now. It's just like Uber and Lyft a few years ago, right? Like the taxi drivers are upset. So now the neighbors in the hotels are upset. And so it's just gotten to a point where um, I, I'm very pro regulation. I want it to professionalize. I want it to to have some stability behind it. But we are kind of the guinea pigs. I mean, we got in this industry early. And so we signed up for that volatility knowing that that existed and so you know it's just one of those things that you have to decide if you want to partake in something like that that does have an additional risk on top of it 
there are counties that do grandfather people in, and then there are counties that don't grandfather people in. And it's just one of those things where the best thing that you can do is make friends with the people who are on city council who are making those decisions to advocate for yourself and show them that you are trying to be an addition to the community and not, you know, something that is destructive. Right. Well, let's take a break. When we come back, you have a mentorship as well. And I'm sharing this and, you know, I might get some letters because some people are not pro Airbnb. We know this, but I'm sharing your story and you specifically, because as I said, you do it so well that if anyone's going to learn how to, if someone's watching and say, yeah, I want to have an Airbnb and, and they just go and do it on their own, that's one thing. But you have a mentorship to teach people how to do it at the level you're doing it so that you can, in fact, be friends with the neighbors and do the right thing and make sure that it's prosperity for all. So we'll be back in just a moment. Okay, Sarah. So as I mentioned, you're an Airbnb owner extraordinaire. You and your best friend own the Carwells. You have Airbnbs in Michigan and also upstate New York. You're hands-on every day with the ones in Michigan. I follow you on Instagram. I followed the hot tub fiasco, all the things I'm thinking, is that going to, you're going to get a brand deal out of that one. But um, so just this hot tub company that didn't deliver and everything was a disaster and you had to get it replaced and all the things. So I really feel like you're trying to give an experience to your, to your clients, the people who rent from you. You're also respectful of your neighbors, which we've talked about. You're following the rules. You want regulations, as you said. So it makes sense. And this is, I think, one of the brilliant parts about what you're doing is I started noticing, wait, I think she's teaching me something. I think I'm learning in this process, even though I don't own Airbnbs. And I realize, oh, you, you're in that space now where you can take something that you've learned and create either a digital product, coaching, or mentorship. And I'm so fascinated by this space right now and learning a lot as I launch my own soon, not Airbnb, but a digital product business. Uh, what? Tell me about that transition when you started thinking, well, wait, this is something we could teach. And it's, I mean, there are people who are traveling the world and getting paid to do it because of digital media. So let's just break it down about how you made that transition from not only being an Airbnb owner and a good one, but now teaching other people how to do it and do it right. Yeah. Um, we had someone reach out to us, honestly, in, on Instagram in the DM saying that we really needed to offer a mentorship. And Emily and I had taken several classes, courses, cohorts to learn everything that we learned about Airbnb. Uh, but what we noticed in all of those is that they were very investment focused. They weren't very hospitality focused. And so it was a lot of people who were in other forms of real estate investing, teaching people how to invest in short term rentals. But primarily to be successful at short term rentals and to get along with your neighbors and to offer a quality experience to guests, that's all hospitality. And so that was a huge missing chunk we felt in the industry and especially in the education of the industry um, for short-term rentals. And so we just saw a gap in the market and we saw that we were having traction with people who were resonating with what we were saying online. And so in 2023, we decided to open up our first round of mentorship. Um, and we do it in small group settings where we let 20 people come in and we kind of plug in with their situation specifically. Um, and we go through classes over 10 weeks of how to do what we do. Um, and we teach people top to bottom, the good, bad, and the ugly. Um, and then after that, we just maintain contact with them. We have a group chat that they're in forevermore as they kind of build up their portfolio. And we just help people achieve what we've achieved in Airbnb. And it's become a whole new source of income for us that we just didn't see coming. So not only are you teaching them how to go about, are you deciding about investment? Are you deciding about rentals? Like you told me this one thing before off there about um, the sound uh, thing that you can get that doesn't record voices, but lets it know if it's up to a certain sound for a certain period of time. So then, you know, there's a party or something. Uh, you talked about how you didn't, <clears throat> excuse me, you didn't have a door uh, camera. So you didn't see that someone literally took everything out of an Airbnb, including the fork and the dishcloth, you know? So these are things that, boy, if you could learn it from somebody else and not have to go through it yourself, those are two simple pieces of technology that are worth 
an entire insides of your Airbnb. Oh, yeah. I mean, the first time we offered this mentorship, one of the first students that came through, we taught them about the tax loophole that short-term rentals provides that just really offers some heavy tax savings for people who are involved in this. And that person ended up saving $18,000 on their taxes in the first class that we offered them. And so it's it's been wild to watch. They make their money on yeah. investment to work with you, right? People buy our 10,000 hours of education in 10 classes. It just, it really changes people's lives. Yeah. And so part of when you show up on Instagram and you're telling stories about what you're doing, you know, you are uh, generating new clients from that. But since you only work with 40 people a year, what is the what is the draw for you to be so hands-on with Instagram and your presence there? Because and you'll have you'll you'll fill your your group already. You know this, right? So I think that attention is the most valuable thing in the world. And I just don't think just like we didn't know that the mentorship was going to bring us a new source of revenue, we just don't know what the attention online is going to bring us down the road. And we're very creative. We don't know that Airbnb is going to be our thing forever. And so that personal brand side of things has become a huge portion of our business that we spend way more hours on than we probably need to or should because we just don't know how it's going to play out in the future. So it's just us putting uh, quarters in our piggy bank for later and just not understanding how that's going to roll out as we continue to grow. Well, a lot of people don't realize when you think about a brand, you know, that's why you're called the Carwells as opposed to something else that's about Airbnbs instead, because you don't know where this is going to go, but you are working together. I watched uh, the reel of your photo shoot and the things that you do, yes, to promote that brand. And one of the things that I've learned as a storyteller and a business owner for many, many years is there's most businesses have a great story and telling that story and making that connection with people is how you stay in business, I think. Yeah. Yeah. And the people that come through our mentorship, you know, I just didn't know if they were going to be people that we were excited about being around, right? Like you open yourself up to now having an in-person connection with other people, you just don't know if you're going to love it or you hate it. But really, when you show up as yourself online and you're transparent, you attract people that are very similar to you. And so it's almost like I, you know, Emily and I were making a call for all of our best friends to find us on the Internet instead of yeah. us having to go out and find them. Yeah, you find the right people when they find you. Yeah. Well, thank you so much. If I'm ever in Michigan or upstate New York, you know, I'll be staying at one of your Airbnbs. I appreciate your time and and I, uh, I appreciate your work ethic and I like, I like following it. So thank you. Thank you for having me. This was a pleasure. Take care.